Hi, this is Maria, and I'm here today with my two friends, Emily. Emily Larson and Emily Armstrong. And we are discussing with Professor Carla Kohler from University of California in Los Angeles. And hope you enjoy, guys, our discussion. My name is Carla Kohler. I'm a professor in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry at UCLA. I'm a biochemist uh, as opposed to a chemist. There's a distinction in our department, <laughs> but we somehow get along. And I work on how proteins are not imported into mitochondria, and I started that for my postdoc work, but as I've, as I've worked at UCLA, we have a really good, um, the medical school is there, the hospital is there. I've got branched out a bit more in looking at disease mechanism and how we can use our studies in basic research maybe to translate at a more fundamental level into strategies to get therapeutics or to treat disease and also how to understand how mitochondrial dysfunction does lead to disease. Mm -hmm. It's been implicated in uh, the latest ones that have been really imp important have been uh, Parkinson's, mm -hmm. um, Alzheimer's, um, Huntington's mm -hmm. potentially, and then you know just regular disease like cardiac disease. Mm -hmm. And there's a, a lot of patients that have a, a general type of mitochondrial disease. They say one in 5,000. And, you know, there's been a lot of nice research in UK down in mitochondria, so it's sort of a, a important area. Mm -hmm. So you said this started from your postdoc, which was in Switzerland. How yeah. did you make the transition from um, going from a U.S. school, going to um, a, abroad for your postdoc, which is what I've done, um, and then back again? So uh, at the time, I was a post. So I I thought I was going to go to veterinary school. School. I grew up on a on a agricultural community. I milked a lot of cows, and <laughs> I was really interested in large animal medicine. And I thought I would go to vet school. And I thought if I didn't get into vet school, I was interested in in the genetic side of of milk production. Mm -hmm. I know it sounds a little analytical. <laughs> it's kind of a nerd. I like biology from a young age, um, but the advances you can make in milk production through animal breeding and so that was mm -hmm. something that interested me mm -hmm. and how you could really improve milk production so I was always interested in the the breeding side and so I thought if I didn't go to vet school I would end up in genetics although at a young age I didn't really know what it was and so I um, I started out going to a, st a state school in Wisconsin at the time we didn't have a vet school and that was the best place to go to get into vet school but it was also a really good science school and so I got into vet school early. I had good grades and at that time you could get in in three years. And so I went to Iowa State because at the time they had the best vet school. And then I got there and after a semester I realized I was more interested in research. There was a, the professor that taught biochemistry was talking about mitochondria and I was really excited. Mm. And so I quit vet school early. Um, I had good grades and I went to tell the dean I didn't want to be in vet school anymore. He told me I was making the biggest mistake of my life <laughs> and he tore up the drop slip. Oh my goodness. So then I went back the next day and turned it in and, and I, you know, didn't look back. And so from there I, I switched over into graduate school and I got, I got a master's at first and it was in, related to mitochondria. It was mitochondria inheritance in, in bovine and then I realized I didn't I needed to work in a research model so I switched for my PhD and started working in Saccharomyces mm -hmm. and I still really wanted to work in protein important to mitochondria and I wanted to work in mitochondria and so at that point I thought um, really the best people that were doing it were in Europe and I thought you know I'm in the Midwest normally you go to the West Coast or East Coast and I didn't have any ties there so I just decided to go to Europe okay. cool. and so that's how I ended up there and then um, I also, I had been a college athlete, I'd been a runner, mm -hmm. and I started doing bike racing instead. And I, when I was a graduate student, I was on a team, and bike racing was really good in, the, in a lot of Wisconsin and, and, and the Midwest at a low level. You know, it wasn't what I did all the time, but it was a way to balance being a graduate student. And so I wanted to go to Switzerland also to race my bike. Nice. And so that was what I, what I did. Cool. And it was a lot of fun. And so when I was a, a postdoc in Switzerland, I didn't 
I, you know, I didn't race all the time because I had to work, but I still rode my bike and I raced locally with a team with some Swiss women and some women from Ukraine. Mm, nice. And it was, it was fun. I got to know, uh, I got to know people outside the lab and um, get integrated a little bit into, into the Swiss, mm-hmm. Swiss yeah. culture. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, I think, I mean, well, other than, well, even Emily is um, an immigrant of sorts being from England <laughs> um, and I'm from the US and Maria is from Greece so we we talk a lot about um, mm-hmm. the benefits of being in an international community but mm-hmm. also how do you integrate into mm-hmm. the community and the culture mm-hmm. that you're in mm-hmm. yeah. you were talking about well we were just talking about funding really um, and you were saying <laughs> oh I, I picked up on mm-hmm. something that you said earlier about taking kind of basic biology and trying to figure mm-hmm. out ways that you can apply it into um, kind of more medical based uh, yeah. applications and we've talked a lot uh, recently about how to do that because our work is kind of fundamental cell mm-hmm. biology. Um, and particularly, Maria and I talk about a lot about the difference between being a plant cell biologist versus yeah. a plant biologist. Mm-hmm. You know, we don't deal with crops. We don't mm-hmm. deal with agriculture at all. We really are cell biologists mm-hmm. who use a plant model system. Right. Um, but And a lot of the things that we study, a lot of the pathways that we study or the molecular machinery that we study is shared mm-hmm. among eukaryotes. Oh. So it's mm-hmm. very applicable within basic models. Yeah. Um, and when talking about impact factor and alt metrics and everything, how do you make the basic fundamental biology discoveries that you're trying to make or, or research um, into something that seems a bit more sellable. And I have like this visceral reaction a lot mm-hmm. of times when people say like, oh, well, can you put it into crops and like yeah. make crops better? Can you make biofuels? And it's like, mm-hmm. well, that's not the point. The point is, is yeah. that we're learning something very important and integral to these systems that we're studying. Mm-hmm. And yes, along the line, that type of information will be very important to how we apply it later on. Mm-hmm. But it's not directly applicable to improving people's lives right now. Yeah. So I'm not. I'm not. I guess my question yeah. is: Is what's your what? What's kind of your opinion on? I mean, I will say, biology and in terms of plant biology, I think they're doing a better job of funding it in Europe than they are in the U.S. Mm-hmm. And that's been the case, I think, for quite a while, right? Mm-hmm. Some of my colleagues, like Danny Schnell, for example, and some of them in the translocation business, mm-hmm. have been able to get some NIH funding, but that's mm-hmm. going down a lot. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And it, it is unfortunate. Um, some other people in the past, you know, like, so my PhD advisor, we were at Iowa State, and he's switched into starch pathways in, in maize. Mm-hmm. And uh, Don Robertson was at at Iowa State, and he came into the lab and said, um, "You know, let's look at Robertson's mutator." And then uh, Mike Scanlon was in my lab, was a, a partner with a lab mate, and he looks on. Um, he's looking at narrow sheath and sheath development mm-hmm. in corn. So there's a lot of good places that have some basic research, and they have NSF funding, and I think they're doing okay. Yeah. But it's always the pressure to have mm. translational even more so in crops unfortunately yeah. in plant biology well and i wonder too even in mammalian biology where if you want to understand these fundamental mechanisms do you end up feeling like you need to use disease as an avenue into this could be applied someday yeah. but we're really using this disease as a system to understand the cell biology well, I think now, for me, the disease is a great way to get into cell biology because mm-hmm. we had a paper that we just we just published some work that is it, I didn't talk about. So it started out in Australia. It was a family had a, a child that was fine, and then it had a second and third child that died a week after birth, and their cerebellum didn't develop. Mm-hmm. And they want to know, can they have a fourth child? Mm-hmm. So they did exome sequencing and found a mitochondrial carrier that we didn't know what it did. And I thought it would be in the inner membrane. And so this came through the clinicians at UCLA, um, and they wanted to collaborate with the basic scientists to figure out, well, you know, what does this thing do? Mm-hmm. And so because of that, we started doing the basic biochemistry on it. And, you know, we know it has to do with mitochondrial, controlling mitochondrial size. We don't know exactly how it does it. We still don't really know what the protein does. But because of the humans having a d- mutation in a disease, we've 
actually found a really nice basic problem to study. Mm, and this absolutely. protein is getting put in and it's turned over right away. And in our cell models, usually when mitochondria are getting turned over, you're inducing mitophagy, some kind mm -hmm. of cell death pathway. And usually the mitochondria, you know, the mitochondria aren't healthy. They're getting ubiquinated. And mm -hmm. what's nice about this protein is it just gets in and ubiquinated and gets pulled out. So we have a, now have a system in which we can just look at protein turnover in the outer membrane without worrying about mitophagy and mm. compromised cell growth. Mm. Obviously in a in an organism it's important, but in the in the cell when you just go down to, you know, a cell is cell in a, is not a necessarily a very good or model for disease because it's very <laughs> you know, yeah. And so but we have a system to really look at the protein turnover now, which I wouldn't have had otherwise. Mm -hmm. So I guess I like disease yeah. in some cases, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's yeah. not good, but... Um, and then because of my work, um, it, I think in the U.S., they, especially general medicine through the NIH, they value basic research still. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so um, because of my, my basic work, I've become involved in the United Mitochondrial Disease Foundation, and now this other study that I talked about, the Oxalosis and Hyperoxaluria Foundation, because of the basic work, and you know, they, 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 they're realizing that maybe some of the, of the cures or strategies can actually come on basic medicine instead of basic research instead of applied, because you know, these are orphan diseases. Yeah, the companies right. don't want to pick them up unless they make a lot of money. Absolutely. It's very optimistic to see that they do want to cooperate, and it's not like just bias towards translated no, science or. But yeah. it but seems from your experience that it's quite balanced. If you want. Uh, right, or you but, make it balanced. But you know, so we're we're for a group of scientists in mitochondria. We're starting a mitochondrial metabolism theme mm -hmm. at UCLA. There's a bunch of us. They they remodel some space. We're coming together. We're sort of working together now to sort of interface with companies mm -hmm. and see if it, it's a, a, for us, ultimately, it's a funding mechanism because our, we don't know how good our yeah. funding is going to be anymore either. Yeah. Um, it's, so it's a way to, to interact with companies and, and a lot of mitochondrial companies are coming online now. A lot of companies are interested in mitochondria from a therapeutic approach. Mm -hmm and realizing they don't know enough, so they want to interface with the basic scientists. So that's something that we're trying to exploit a little bit. Mm -hmm. nice. And I think, you know, I'm still always at heart, I'm a mechanistic scientist, but, you know, if, if I could cure something or get a, a strategy for something, yeah, of that would, that's yeah. always a great outcome, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, for sure, yeah. for sure. Um, and coming back to this, like, I'm on this, the Scientific and Medical Advisory Board right now for the United Mitochondrial Disease Foundation, okay. and it's very much a patient-driven mm -hmm. uh, foundation, and they raise money and have, mm -hmm. you know, bake sales and walks, but they have an annual meeting, and the basic scientists, we go in and we, the patient meeting and the science meeting, but then we have lunch together and dinner mm -hmm. together, so get to know some of the patients and their families and mm -hmm. you know and they they want to know what you know is there a cure but mm -hmm. they're really interested in learning because you know they again they're all a collection of diseases each one is rare yeah. mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. it, they don't have necessarily have a path to have somebody working on them so they really appreciate the basic scientists yeah, absolutely. yeah. and I think having that um, venue where scientists can make direct interactions with mm -hmm. their community even yeah. if it's a subset of the community is useful. Mm -hmm. um, before I went to graduate school, I worked um, at the University of Washington in Seattle in breast and ovarian cancer, and it was a translational research lab. I worked on the research side, but there were also um, clinical trials happening mm -hmm. at the time, and so we got to meet a lot of the patients. Um, and one of the things that I took away from it and something that I tell my friends and family is if you want to help breast and ovarian cancer, if your doctor asks you for a biopsy for a control or mm -hmm. for some kind of clinical test, give it to them because mm -hmm. that is a way that you can directly really right. engage with science. Mm -hmm. And I think that when you do that, maybe you can really see that work is happening, even if it's kind of behind this curtain that not all citizens get to see all the mm -hmm. time. Absolutely. And I think as someone with a rare disease, I think it's really important or do you sort of lift the veil between the science community and the patients? Because yeah. a lot of the people I know who aren't scientists and sort mm -hmm. of bridging the gap yeah. sort of have this 
completely they have this complete alienated view of all the science going on mm-hmm. and don't really understand how you know how they can actually get involved yeah. in it and how really close the two worlds are together and mm-hmm. it's events like that and research like this which yeah. really helps and also to understand the timeline that all of this stuff has to happen in. absolutely yeah. yeah the other thing we do at the umdf meeting is it's in washington every other year and we go and storm the hill and we go and talk to the representatives and hmm. congressmen and that's fun because last time i went with patients and you get to hear their story and you know both the patients and mm-hmm. the, the researchers are mm-hmm. talking to the representatives of course from california so they're always sympathetic you know? <laughs> it's a big voting block <laughs> yeah so i mean they're they're usually pretty knowledgeable mm-hmm. but i some of the other ones yeah it'd be better to go talk to paul ryan <laughs> if you can get to him yes yeah he's running away and hiding <laughs> yeah how um how did you start up your lab um and what type of things did you learn from starting up the lab mm. that you would maybe do differently now that you have? Um, so when I when I was on the job market, you know, I guess I was looking, at the time it was easier to get jobs in the U.S. than in, in Europe. I think there were just more jobs, you know, and I, and when I was, when I was in Jeff Schatz's lab, Jeff was retiring, so I had a, you know, I didn't have this luxury, but I'd been in my postdoc long enough by then. I mm-hmm. sort of start, I you know, I got I got lucky a little bit with the project, right? If I wouldn't have had that, um, if it wouldn't have turned out as well, I would have stayed in industry, and I probably would have stayed in Europe because mm-hmm. I like living in Europe. And uh, but then things went well, so I went on the job market in the states, and I had a lot of interviews, and I had quite a few offers, and the best one was UCLA. And so the things that I did then that I think helped a lot were, you know, I knew I was going there, so I wrote all my grants. Mm-hmm. For, first of all, I could take my project with me, so uh, that that's, that's, that's yeah. And the big. postdocs I have in my lab, they can take their project with me. I think that's them with them. I try to give them something, mm-hmm. and I think that's important. Absolutely, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. it's not always the case for some people. I mean, and and maybe it doesn't work out that way. Sometimes you know you might, you might come into, uh, you know, if if you. I also think it's important to switch areas a little bit. Mm-hmm. For your postdoc because then you have different expertise and so when I went to Jeff's lab I hadn't worked in I had by some basic biochemistry but I hadn't really worked as deep in biochemistry as there but I had this really good genetics background from from being in in this lab I was in and so I started doing um, a genetic approach and that really opened things up for me and then you know Jeff was retiring which was good um, but I started doing some stuff there in mammalian cells already. And so I was sort of setting it up so that I wouldn't have to just do the same thing that I had been doing in my postdoc. Mm-hmm. And so then I set up it at UCLA. And so I wrote my grants ahead of time. I could, I could take my project with me. And they have a lot of young investigator grants. I got a, mm-hmm. I got a, uh, a Damon Runyon, and that mm-hmm. really helped. And, uh, and then I got my NIH grant right away. And... Uh, so I had really good funding, and when I was in Switzerland, I hired a technician from UCLA to come over and help me mm. set up things, and so then when she got to the States, she knew how to do things. I sort of trained her, yes. and I was in a position to bring two graduate students with me, which, oh, brilliant. which is atypical, yeah. but you know, they were diploma students that had worked with me, and they wanted to come to the States for a PhD, and so um, they came, and so I, I was lucky. I had two students that knew what to do, and I had a, a technician. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then I, probably the biggest mistake I made is I got a little big in the beginning because I had a lot of funding and, um, you know, I all of a sudden had four students and a tech. Yeah, yeah. And a couple postdocs. But it worked But it worked out okay, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, so you, you know, think that it's better to start slowly, more like with one postdoc? Yeah. Two we, um, our to first to interview was with Wendy Bickmore, who... Uh-huh. Um, is the director of the human genome mm. unit at Edinburgh. Yeah. Um, and she was saying that she kind of started off with like, what, one postdoc? Yeah. Um, and then kind of built from there. And she thought that that, for her, mm-hmm. her, her opinion was that starting where you can kind of slowly give your mm-hmm. technical expertise to your mm-hmm. staff kind of helps you transition. And it helps you, I think, as mm-hmm. someone who's trained in the lab, to move into a more administrative role? Well, you know, part of it was when Jeff Schatz was shutting down his lab, I was the last postdoc, 
I was already managing a lot of people mm. because there were a okay. bunch of technicians. It was the Swiss system was good. They actually had money for technicians and and then yeah. diploma students. And so what would happen is some of the technicians started working for other people, but as people left, I started, you know, I, I had and Jeff wanted to take some Jeff wanted to keep the lab kind of active in the end. Mm-hmm. So he said, "Well, let's take some diploma students, right?" So we took two diploma students and there were um, four technicians, and there was one other postdoc and me. So I was spent all my time really, and I was on the job market, going on trips to the U.S. Mm-hmm. to interview. So I spent all my time managing people there already, okay. mm-hmm. and so I wasn't in the lab that much at the end. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, and you know, the technicians were good, but you, they still needed a lot of management. So mm-hmm. I think I was already doing that. So mm-hmm. it wasn't such a big transition. Okay. And then I was lucky to have. Two of the students came with me, that they knew already. and they knew what to do. Yeah. Yeah. And when I le- when when I left Jeff's lab because I was running all these techs, we're running and we were working on a bunch of different things. I really had two or three projects that were ready to go, and so yeah. it was easy to put. I put one student on one and one on the other area, mm-hmm. and then I got some more students to fill in the gaps. So that worked out. That worked out well in my case. Yeah, I mean, so it sounds like professionally you were really set up to like. Just yeah. hit the ground running when you got to UCLA. Were there more like not? I don't want to say like personal, personal mm-hmm. um, complications, but what were the kinds of things that you felt like you really had to balance when you started thinking about what job offer to take mm-hmm. and where to start or so where you wanted to end up? I'm single and I don't have a family, so so it was I easy. didn't have any. I just had to figure yeah. out where the best place was yeah. I wanted to live. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How do you? Um, kind of counsel your students about finding a balance between their work and the culture of, I think, graduate graduate school and maintaining a sense of self? Because I know I struggled with that as a PhD student a lot, or maybe there isn't. <laughs> well, I think, I don't know. Some of them I do. I, I try to pick people that I think will, first of all, I want to, I want people that are really dedicated in the lab. Mm-hmm. And so I sort of self the sort of self selection for those kind of graduate students. I don't necessarily get that many rotation students, but then the students that join are really good students, mm-hmm. so that's good. Um, and then I I work a lot on their nights and weekends, and they kind of fall into the culture mm-hmm. of that. Mm-hmm. It's part of like, and they're really social together. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the graduate students at UCLA are very social. They're you know they take classes together. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and they have activities. They have their own grad student clubs. So I think, uh, I think their biggest problem right now is like, what am I going to do when I'm done? But mm. the job market, even my students with just PhDs, are getting really good jobs That's in good. industry. So mm-hmm. I'd say we have a shortage yeah. right now of PhDs, postdocs. For you know, postdocs. a lot of them don't yeah. do post are not getting postdocs. Mm. They're getting pretty good positions. Yeah. There was a article in. I think it was like Nature Careers, maybe a year or two ago, that they went back and forth. They would have an article talking about how doing a postdoc really doesn't help your career in the long run, that it just kind of sets you behind being able to start right away into industry. That's where all the jobs are. So if you're interested in industry, don't mm. do a postdoc no, I don't think that's all. true, because I had a PhD student that went to Richard Yule's lab for a postdoc, he sort of started the small molecule screening in my lab, and then he went to Richard's lab and set up another one. He's got a really high level of um, it, in the neurodegeneration and Pfizer setting up mm. the small molecules. Mm. So I think he couldn't have got that position without yeah. the postdoc. Mm. Yeah, I think just even from like um, a personal growth perspective, making the transition yeah. from like the student mindset where you're kind of in training and mm-hmm. you still have to really take the lead, even if you feel confident in your own project. Yeah. Um, I feel like I've really learned a lot in my postdoc about developing my own ideas, yeah. being able to uh, organize with other people, and have a bit more of ownership. Mm-hmm. Over I think. I think. My you, ideas. I mean, as much as a postdoc is another, you know, it's another thing you got to do. I think in moving into industry, I think you get hired at a higher level because they know you can start something independently, right? Yeah, yeah. Usually, the PhD, you could be told every experiment to do, right? And yeah. and you could do it. And yeah, you don't know how much of it is. 
how much of it is the lab environment and the PI versus the student. Yeah. And so if you get hired there versus, okay, you went to a postdoc, you set this up, you know, I know you can set up something new in industry. Yeah, 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 yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. I think the people that do the postdoc are a little better off in industry, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. a little bit more. And also you would, you have another, another few years at training where you see a lot of different things usually I think you do in the postdoc, right? Because yeah. you, you have the opportunity to, right? And you can do different things. And um, the university has so many different levels of activities going on maybe than you'd see in industry mm-hmm. that you're more savvy at what you want to do in industry. Because I think a lot of what happens in industry is it's jumping from job to job, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. The other thing that UCLA is doing really well, and they're probably doing it here, is an entrepreneurial science. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the students and the postdocs are doing it, and the postdocs are doing it just as much. And so there's, an, there's you know, and they have networking, and they have ways of meeting with people in companies. And, mm-hmm. you know, my people are doing this classes where they have to promote something. Another one, they're working on consulting one of the students was interviewing about setting up a vineyard, and I was listening to her. She's out in the outdoor office, like, "What are you doing? You don't know anything about a <laughs> vineyard." So this is a training for a class. I'm like, oh, okay, <laughs> you know. So there's all this stuff going on that I don't know because I don't have time. But right. yeah, yeah, yeah. they all seem to find out, and yeah, I think it's yeah. pretty good. Yeah. So you have a very good system from the university that supports. Apart yeah. from what you're doing right. as a and PI, you have a university stuff that with the business school, the business of science, mm-hmm. the big. And, you know, they're getting in patent law, industry, all these people are talking about careers. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. I know at least um, when I was coming out, out of my PhD, there was a little bit of maybe buyer's remorse because I felt like I had been put up as like, oh, academic academia mm-hmm. is so great, being a PI is so awesome, everything is so great. And then I looked at the job market <laughs> and yeah. just was like, oh this doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. It doesn't exist the way that, you know, well, the Regis professors or that the tenured professors, like even tenure track doesn't exist in the same way anymore. And I thought, how am I, how am I going to do this? You know? Well, As, I still think it's a good job, but it's, it's you know, it's a lot of work. And anything in science, I think, is, yeah, un- unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, I mean, with, with the um, kind of the, the experience that you have of starting starting your own lab, Getting getting tenure at a at a great school and now being a current researcher, what are the types of things that you would suggest someone who wants to get a PhD think about when about getting yeah. about deciding to get a PhD and what kind of things that they might they maybe should look for in an advisor? Well, I think I think whatever you decide you want to do has to be your passion. It's like being a priest or something, right? <laughs> yeah. Because if it's it your isn't, mm. yeah. yeah. And I think a lot of uh, you know, I get a lot, especially the women and grad students. They come in and they say, "I want your job," and they're sort of, you know, deer in the headlights. And then yeah. they realize what that means. Mm. They think it's, you know, and I, I don't know. I hear a lot now about work life balance. Yeah. yeah. Mm. And. I think it's like the unicorn. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think you, sure, I, I would say I have work-life balance. I ride my bike and I work. Mm-hmm. That's what I want, you know. Mm-hmm. So I think that's, if that's what you want, that's okay. But if you want work-life balance, like I want to have every weekend to go with my significant other and go hiking and walk on the beach and, you know, barely do eight to five and not do anything more. Mm. It, it, sometimes it works out, but sometimes it doesn't, you know. Mm-hmm. I think... If that's what you want, I think you need a a job that's more in line with that kind of lifestyle. And I don't I don't think any even industry I don't think is necessarily like that. Right. You know, I, maybe you want to teach um, K to twelve or something, right? Or community college. Yeah. 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 But again, it's, I think very personal because okay, I I can understand that this nine to five in science does it work and it does it work sometimes even for the experiments that you do you know they're not gonna finish at five you know yeah. anyway so all of us we know that we have to come on the weekends or mm-hmm. work like later your cells don't know that it's the yeah weekend. exactly <laughs> or the plants well, that you don't yeah. need water but the thing is also how you manage your time that's yeah, also important that's because you know managing. if you come at nine yeah. and you spend like two hours on facebook yeah. twitter emails and stuff like that you are losing the time, but if you are quite productive at this mm-hmm. nine to five or nine mm-hmm. whatever time, 
it's also very personal how good you are with mm-hmm. the time management. Yeah. Which I think I, I, I think that that was something I learned a lot in graduate school because mm-hmm. you do end up having to, at least right. in the U.S. All these system, deadlines. you have, I mean, but you have your classwork, yeah. yeah, you have your experiments you have Teaching. to do, you might have to teach, and then, mm-hmm. yeah, and then whatever your deadlines are, how much mm-hmm. maybe your advisor expects you to participate in grant writing or paper writing or whatever, there's a lot, there are a lot of balls that you could potentially have mm-hmm. in the air, um, and all of that probably affects the types of opportunities you're going to have later, mm. too. But. So when you ride your bike, let's move mm. outside. <laughs> are you doing that in groups still? With uh, Are you doing, like, with teams? Or uh, well, I used like, to. So yeah. when I went back to, the, to L.A., I was on a team, a racing team, and we were mm. developing women for the national team and the Olympic team, oh. so oh, younger nice. women. Um, and then... I, now I just try to ride for fun. I ride my bike in the morning because in Los Angeles there's a lot of traffic. So during yeah. the week we ride at <laughs> 6 in the morning. And I get up early. So I get up early anyway. And yeah. then on the weekend we ride up the coast and longer wow. rides. Nice. Mm-hmm. Okay, good. And then I, I ride motorcycles. Nice. Oh. And I Excellent. officiate bike, ri- bike races usually on motorcycles. Nice. Mm. So I still do something active. Mm-hmm. Very yeah. nice. Very different, I think. Yeah. Well, I think it... it goes to show like as you said like work-life balance is kind of mm-hmm. whatever you make it out to right. be for yourself yeah. Yeah. Um, but it is something and because I raced bicycles in Los Angeles I met a whole crew of people outside mm-hmm. of the university yeah. Yeah. yeah and I've made a lot of good friends that's how I, why I go to Lake George every yeah. every summer mm-hmm. yeah um I have yeah. a really good friend and she's got a 12 year old daughter who does Irish dance. Nice. Wow. And so, you know, I've come, kind of come an aunt to her. So, you know, I have a good network of friends and stuff mm, in yeah. Los Angeles. Mm, yeah. Nice. And so that becomes more important. And, you know, sometimes in a big city it's easy to do because everybody, everybody's got a similar story. You know, yeah. everybody's a transplant. Yeah. And, yeah. And I think particularly in those cases when you have these kind of international or transplanty st- mm-hmm. style of, of communities, um, we, you know, we were talking a little more about support systems and family but I think it's also kind of your adoptive family as well yeah and that is something that I appreciate about Mm -hmm. the research environment is that wherever you move you end up kind of getting just plunked into Mm -hmm. um a ready-made friend base Mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. for the most part Mm -hmm. I think Mm -hmm. so it's um Mm -hmm. and then what you do is right because I go to scientific meetings or I'm a postdoc grad student you make a lot of friends along the way right yeah Yeah. and you see those people at some point yeah and this is something maybe that isn't necessarily talked about when we talk about networking the importance Mm -hmm. of networking that it's not just professional kind of shoes no no it's also you know making these connections a lot of times your professional friends become your close friends right especially like for women you know, because I still think it's harder for women. It's hmm. a it's a guy's network. The guys yeah. get promoted more just because it's how they are, right? Yeah. Women are more nurturing, I think. And so, you know, I've got a good network of other female scientists that I've become really good friends with. and hmm. mm-hmm. Yeah, you can kind of help push each other along. Yeah, and so that's that's nice. Hmm. You know, and th- but there's a lot of men that I've become friends with, too. That yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. cool. Um, Anything else we should? should maybe we can talk a bit about uh, social media. I know that you have oh. a Twitter account, but uh, yeah. are you using that for networking or outreach? Not your so science? much. I don't <laughs> have time. Okay. I follow uh, bike racing on it. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I follow the Rogue POTUS accounts so nice. tell what's going on inside <laughs> the White House. Yeah. How's it for? I mean, I'm on the UMDF. I follow that, and I put some things like on Twitter. I put a, a mitochondria. I don't know if you've seen my Twitter. Yeah, account. yeah. <laughs> yeah my, it's, I was racing on the Manchester Velodrome mm-hmm. in that picture. Cool. Um, mm-hmm. yeah. So I put some of that. I actually put mitochondrial biologist on it. So I've got yeah. very, I've gotten very uh, exposing of myself on Twitter, but I don't post anything. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Well, thank you very much for making yeah, this no time problem. for us. Thanks for listening. If you're interested in our other podcasts, you can find all of those recordings on our Institute webpage, as well as the Institute's social media handles. And you can follow us on Twitter. I'm at ERLarson underscore PhD. I'm Emily X Armstrong. And I am M underscore Papanatu. Join us again for our next podcast coming soon.